Yo, what's going on guys? I'm Mike from Mobox, and in this tutorial, which is sponsored by Skillshare, click the link down in the description for a free trial, we're gonna be talking about how to create this cork board pin with a ripped piece of paper. There's actually a lot going on in this. So we have obviously the cork board, we have the pins, we have the ripped piece of paper, and then we also have a highlighter on that um, piece of paper. So it's kind of a lot going on. We're gonna be mixing again After Effects with Blender. So if you're familiar with After Effects and you wanna learn Blender, this is the perfect tutorial for you. I should also note that this project file will be available on our Patreon account. Link will be down in the description. If you're not comfortable with Patreon, we'll also upload it to Gumroad where you can download it on an individual basis. So I guess jumping here into After Effects, we have this sort of piece of paper, ripped piece of paper texture already created. Warning, I downloaded this texture from a website called Pixel Buddha. You have to give them your email to get it. And quite frankly, I have no idea if this is gonna result in like tons of spam for my inbox, but um, it's the best ripped paper textures I was able to find. And if you want to get this, if you get this project file, you'll need to also download these textures um, for it all to kind of work seamlessly. So I also have a uh, screenshot of a new story. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, going to drag this paper composition down here and create a new composition with that paper composition inside of it. And I'm gonna drag my new story on, which is just screenshot. And I'm just gonna hit S on the keyboard and scale this up just a bit because it didn't quite fully um, fill my composition. And I'm just gonna maybe drag this down. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to use this paper texture as a luma mat for my article. So I'm just gonna change the screenshot blending mode, or the track mat mode, I'm sorry, the track map mode, not the blending mode, to uh, Luma Map. And so what that does is that's gonna cut out my new story. And you can see here that it cuts it out pretty well. We'll notice that like we do get some transparency here. I don't know, there's just some weirdness. So I'm going to duplicate this paper texture, Control D, uh, not Control S, Control D. Okay, bring it to the bottom, make it visible. And I'm just gonna create a layer new solid and I'm gonna make this white. I'm gonna put it underneath the paper and I'm gonna set this one uh, Luma Mat as well. And you can see that it fills out some of the transparency issues. I did also do some highlighters. So just to add some sort of interest to this, I went ahead and I took a Sharpie and I just made a bunch of lines on a piece of paper, quickly took a snapshot of it with my phone um, and added it to my Google Drive. And here we have it here. So what we wanna do with this is we wanna add some highlighters um, over this article. And you can see here that this isn't like supremely high quality, but you'll notice that it doesn't really matter all that much. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add an effect here that I created on my my own, but it has a bunch of effects in it that you could just basically copy and paste. Um, I'm sorry, not copy and paste, just reproduce in your After Effects. Um, I named it RE Ink because you will see this effect a lot in uh, on the Real Science and the Real Engineering YouTube channels because I do this effect a lot there. So I'm just gonna open this up here so you could see all of the effects. We started with an extract where we sort of shrunk the dynamic range. We added a rough and edges um, to sort of clean up some of the edges and then we added a tint. Now this tint is how you'll change the color of the highlighter. Um, and then to get it to sort of blend properly, we're just gonna change the blending mode to uh, linear burn. And you can see here on this text, it overlays perfectly. So I'm just gonna just mask a few of these lines out. Okay, so now I'm just going to animate this very easily. I'm just gonna hit M on the keyboard on both of these and set a mask path, just zoom in here. So at maybe half of a second, um, I want this first mask to be closed. Ugh, why is this so annoying? There it is. And I want this to maybe take like, I don't know, less than a second, maybe a second in total time. This is like a totally long composition. So I'm just gonna pull all this stuff in. We don't need it to be 14 seconds long, six seconds maximum. And then once we come to the end here, I'm gonna set a keyframe on this one as well, back here, extend this out. And now I could just add some smoothing here with this motion script. You could of course just recreate these, um, these graphs in the graph editor as well. I just prefer to use this. Um, because that's what I've always used. Now, some people will tell you that that's, you know, that you shouldn't use this and you probably shouldn't rely on it a hundred percent, but it definitely gets you a good look like pretty quickly. Um, and then you could adjust it later. I will add some motion blur. So that way it, it looks a little bit more interesting and it appears that that's doesn't, oh, it does affect it just a little bit. Okay, um, pretty simple. Now we could just export this 
and I could bring it into Blender. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Composition, um, Add to Render Queue, and I've got a export mode called PNG Sequence, but you can just uh, copy these settings here. And I'm going to just select, or I'll just save it here, and I'm going to hit Render. So while we wait for this to render out, I just want to tell you a little bit about Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of courses on pretty much everything from productivity to filmmaking. In my opinion, I really do believe that this is the future of learning. It's an amazing way to find highly qualified and high quality teachers and lessons to get started on learning something new. Definitely useful if I want to continue learning and expanding my filmmaking skills, which is on my list to do in 2021. I've also been enjoying this course by Steven Pearson. It guides you through creating and designing a modern house in Blender 2.8. I love how it's broken up into small bite-sized chunks so I could learn at my own speed and fit a lesson in when I have some downtime. I think the reason that I like Skillshare is that it feels a little bit more curated, more worth my time. Also, it's very affordable compared to other avenues of learning, especially higher education. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month, which is totally crazy if you know how much college tuition typically is. So with that said, I've teamed up with them to offer a free trial of premium membership to the first 1,000 of you guys that click the link down in the description. This is the future of learning, and I'm so happy to be able to help you get started on this journey. Okay, so it's all done now. We could just jump into Blender here. And I'm just going to delete everything we have on screen and I'm going to hit shift a and I'm going to add a plane and coming from the Y view, I'm just going to hit R on the keyboard and rotate this. Now, if you hold control while you rotate, it actually rotates like on like dedicated like five degree or 10 degree. I don't know how much it is, but you can get like a perfect rotation, which is nice. We're going to just going to texture this really quickly. I'm just going to select this layer. Um, actually, before we do any of that, I'm just going to change this from EV to cycles. That way we get really beautiful path trace lighting. And I'm going to set this to GPU compute because I'm using a graphics card that supports GPU rendering. And if you do also, then you should be using GPU compute. Now, I also have a graphics card from NVIDIA. I have the RTX 3090, which allows me to use optics denoising for both my render, but also my viewport, which will allow me to visualize what I'm doing in Blender a lot quicker. Graphics card is very important, and if you could afford it, you should definitely get a the highest end graphics card you possibly can. It's gonna save you a ton of time in rendering, but it's also gonna add um, a benefits while working in, in Blender as well. I'm also gonna to go to Light Pass. I'm gonna set this to four, two, 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 two. Now with this layer selected, I guess I should go into the shading view. I'm just gonna create a new a new texture. And if you have the Node Wrangler plugin installed, which is very simple, you should totally should install it under Edit Preferences um, Add-ons. If you just search for Node Wrangler in here, and you should just check that box and, and have it on. If I select the principal BSDF and I hit Control Shift T, it will um, allow me to select from my files. And I've got a texture uh, downloaded already from COO Textures. It's basically a Creative Commons texture website. Um, if I just go to my materials folder and go to cork, so you could download this texture, it's called cork001. Um, I could select all of these layers or all of these images, hit principal PSDF, PSDF setup, and uh, it's frozen. There it is, okay. So it actually just like, it basically adds the texture with all of the sort of color bump and everything added without you having to sort of create all this notes. I don't want any displacement on this, so I'm actually just gonna delete the displacement, but everything else is pretty good. I want this cork board to be a lot like larger. I don't really need it to be bigger. I just need the texture to be like more dense. Over here at scale, I'm gonna set this to three and that will sort of shrink down the texture. And then I find that this texture is a little bit flat, but we should probably go to our shading mode. Okay, well, I guess we should also create our world texture as well. Um, so I'm going to set up my lighting and I'm going to be using an HDRI. So if you're not familiar with Blender um, or 3D, you could add lights to your scene and, and you could do it that way. Or you can download a special file. One of the most common websites is HDR Haven, where you can download what are called HDRIs. And they're basically like 3D um, or sphere images. So if you go to Google Maps Street View, how you could like sort of look around the image. It's basically an image like that, but it has a lot more um, dynamic range in the um, brightness. So lights in that HDR image will appear like real lights um, in the scene. And so it provides you with really natural, great lighting as well as natural reflections as well. So I'm just going to hit Shift A 
and search for an environment texture. Connect it up to my background color. I'm going to hit open and I've got a bunch of HDRIs installed. My go-to indoor one is the Peppermint Power Plant, which again, you could download on, on HDR Haven. And so now I can start making some, some choices about how I want this cork to look. So I'm gonna come back up down to um, Object, and I'm actually gonna add a um, Curves. And I do that by hitting Shift-A again. And I'm just going to basically add a little bit of an S-curve to this. And the problem with that, doing that, is that you notice the saturation goes through the roof. So I'm also gonna add a, a hue and saturation node and I'm gonna bring down the saturation just a bit. And I think that, that looks pretty good. We could always make adjustments in After Effects later as well. So I think we're good there. Now we're just going to add our image sequence, which this is the fun part. I'm gonna go back to layout and I'm gonna hit Shift A and go to image, images, planes. This is also a plugin that you can download or you can install via the same method we did before, edit preferences, add-ons and search for images as planes. So you want to make sure that that's enabled and that way you'll get this setting. I'm going to select that and I'm going to navigate to where I exported my paper sequence with my news article and I'm going to select all of these layers and you need to do something very important here. You need to select animated image sequence. If you don't do this, it's not going to work. Select that and while I'm here also, I'm going to note um, 152 images, okay? That's going to be important for so I know how long my composition needs to be. So I'm gonna make sure that's it's enabled. Import images as planes, and it imports like near instantly. Change the rendering view. And I'm gonna do the same thing I did on the cork board. Um, R on the keyboard, holding control to rotate. And we see it sort of clipping into the cork board. So I'm actually going to hit G on the keyboard and hit X to constrain it to the X axis, and then just move it just above the cork board. So let me show you what this would look like if our transparency or if our um, number of samples wasn't high enough. You're going to get a weird sort of alpha shadow. So you just want to make sure if you do have that, just increase this transparency until it goes away. If you have a bunch of layers here with a bunch of transparency, you might have to increase the number of transparency samples up like way higher. Jumping back into the shading tab with our images selected, uh, we're going to add a few nodes here to get this to look as great as it can. And then we're going to bundle those nodes together into a node group that then you could use if you've got multiple pieces of paper or you have you want to import this for later compositions. It's really easy if you have one node group. So I'm going to shift A again and look for a curves. One thing I noticed is these images get kind of, they look like washed out. And part of that is because of the roughness and just how sort of real textures look. So I like to add just a little bit of, an, of a curve to it. And I did increase the roughness a bit as well. Next up, we want to add a bump map to this. So it actually looks like paper and not just like a flat blob. And I found this really great paper texture from unsplash.com. If you just go to unsplash, search paper texture, um, you'll find it. And um, if you do download this project file on Patreon, you will get it as well because those are Creative Commons images that I'm able to use. I'm just gonna hit uh, Shift A and search for image texture. And I'm going to find that image texture, which is this one. And I'm gonna search, get a node, search for a node called bump. And I'm gonna put the color into the height and then the normal into the normal. And you can see that there what that does is it does add quite a bit of texture. One thing I'm noticing is that this paper is like way too big. So I'm just going to hit S on the keyboard and scale it down a bit. So it's actually looks like it's on a cork board and I'm going to adjust some of these bump settings. So it's not so extreme for one. I'm going to change the strength to like 0.3 and the distance down to like 0.1. And you could adjust that to your heart's content. I, I don't really want it to be extremely bumpy, but I do want it to sort of catch the light. And you can see that there's, there's like a crease down the center, which kind of looks cool. If you like this, you can also bring the color into the roughness and then some of the darker areas will be more shiny. That's sort of reminiscent of um, when you print on paper, you know, the paper is very dull, but sometimes the ink has sort of a shiny look. So you might want to do that. Now all you would need to do is if I select all of these nodes and hit control G, I basically just created this, created a node group. If I hit tab, I'll tab out of that node group. And you can see here that I have my node. So what's great about this is I can come here and change this name to paper node. And now I could import this node group into other compositions or other projects. I can just easily shift A, search for paper node and add that paper node. And then if I have an image texture, 
I'll just connect the color to the color, the alpha to the alpha, and it will kind of add the texture to it and um, do all that for me, which is nice. Now, we want this paper to look not like it's just a flat piece of paper. Nothing is perfectly flat in real life. I'm going to have this layer selected, right click, um, one, I guess I can right click and hit shade, shade smooth. I want to hit tab to enter edit mode, right click and hit subdivide, and then subdivide this as many times as you want. Eight or nine times is probably plenty. If I stay in edit mode with a uh, vertex selection tool, as well as proportional editing on, I can grab a pin and I can hit G on the keyboard, scale that down. And you can see that I'm proportionally editing the the node and to scale this you, i'm just wrote rolling my um my center mouse wheel and you notice that it kind of looks like a bell which i don't like so i'm going to drop down this to sharp and i'm going to hit g on the keyboard x on the keyboard and that will constrain it to my x-axis and i could just sort of pull this bottom bit out a little bit at the edges and then maybe sort of more at the bottom and then maybe one or two spots along the center maybe along the edge just to give it a little bit of more dynamicism. And so now it sort of looks like it's peeling off the wall a little bit. I could also just hit G on the keyboard and move it in the x-axis so it's a little bit far, a little bit closer to the wall. And so we notice that we are kind of clipping here. I'm gonna bring that out a bit so it's not clipping anymore. And it does look like we're a little close to the wall, the bottom there. So that looks pretty cool. That way, when we're looking at it from an angle, we get a really nice look. Let's move on to adding the pins. So I'm just going to hit Shift A, go to Mesh, Cylinder, hit G on the keyboard and then Y on the keyboard to move it over, scale it down a bit. First thing, pins are a little bit taller than this. So I'm going to just hit S and then Z on the keyboard to kind of make it taller. You're gonna to wanna to look at the pin to kind of get an idea of how many points there are, but this is gonna be very tiny and we don't really need that many points. Like it, most people won't even be able to actually see the pin. So we don't wanna add like too many vert vertices, especially for something so tiny. But um, at the same time, we do want it to look smooth. So I will right click and hit shade smooth. And then I'm gonna tab into edit mode. I'm gonna start by hitting control R to add an edge loop. And I'm gonna add an edge loop at the top, maybe about there and an edge loop at the bottom about there. If I grab this and we need to turn off proportional editing, I'm just gonna hit S on the keyboard to scale this down. Now, you notice here that it only grabbed the front bit of points. So I don't want that to happen. I need to make sure I have selected the X-ray tool. That, that way it'll grab all of the points when I select the points from one side. And hit S on the keyboard and scale this down. I need to scale down the top as well and uh, scale down the center and maybe bring that down just a bit. You notice that this is sort of rounded on a pin and this is sort of rounded on a pin. So we want to sort of copy that that look. And I'm just going to hit Control R to add an edge loop, hit S on the keyboard to sort of scale that up. R on the keyboard, another edge loop, scale that up. And now we could just add a subdivide surface modifier and increase the numbers. And you'll see it kind of looks really nasty, but we could fix that by adding another edge loop at the top, one at that angle, another one at that angle, and one at the bottom. So that looks a little bit better, but I think my proportions are like all off. So you can hit S on the keyboard. Yeah, so that looks a lot closer to what the pins look like. Um, now looking at the bottom, I need to add the little metal bit. So I'm just gonna hit three on the keyboard for face selection mode, select this bottom face, hit I to insert, an, in it, insert a face, scale that down, hit E on the keyboard to extru extrude down. And now we have our metal pin. Now we're gonna do the same thing we did before is add edge loops to this. The top and bottom to straighten it out. And then at the top, if you're getting like weird lighting issues, um, you see here that we are getting some like weird lighting there is we can just insert a face here as well. And that just adds a little bit more geometry for the subdivide surface modifier to um, smooth out the, the edges there. So now we just need to make two textures for this. So with this selected, I'm going to create a new texture that I'm gonna name plastic. We wanna make these pins all be different colors, but we don't wanna actually have to like make multiple different color textures. So we could actually do that pretty simply with um, just a few nodes. So the first node I'm gonna look for is an object 
info node. I'm going to add a hue and saturation node. I'm going to look for a brightness and contrast node. So with the object info node, we can get a random number from the object and I'm going to plug that into the hue and then connect these colors to the base color. And then I'm going to bring the roughness down so it's more like a plasticky color or a plasticky texture. Now, if I change this color to sort of blue, um, the color won't match because it is a random hue, but this sort of helps me control the saturation, how saturated I want it to be. And then here I can also sort of adjust the color profile. And if I select this object and I hit Shift D and duplicate it a bunch of times, you'll see the different colors that we can get. Um, and that's based on what we have here. With just a few changes on these dials, you can very quickly um, sort of change the very the, the optional colors. So whether we want, you know, very pastel -y colors, what have you, um, it's pretty simple to just adjust some of these sliders. So I'm pretty happy with those colors. Now we just need to change the color of the bottom because it's supposed to be metal. So I'm just gonna delete a bunch of these because we don't need all of them. With it selected, I'm gonna go under materials and I'm gonna hit add and I'm gonna make new. I'm gonna name this metal. And I'm going to tab into edit mode, hit three to go into face selection mode, select those faces and hit assign. And you notice that it sort of is bleeding down. So we could hit control R to create an edge loop and sort of pull that up a bit. Now with this metal texture, I'm just going to bring the metallic all the way up and the roughness down, and that's good. We don't need to add a texture or anything to that. It just now is a metal pin. So this is obviously extremely large, so I could just scale this down by hitting S on the keyboard, going to the side view, rotating it, and just bringing it onto my piece of paper, and maybe scaling this down a little bit more. Most pins are very close to the paper, but you do want it to have a little bit of variation, and I'm just gonna hit Control D and add a second pin there. One downside to this is I'll be honest, is that you can't really control, like if I wanted this pin to be green and this one to be, to be blue, I'd basically just have to like duplicate these a million times until I got the colors that I wanted and then deleted the ones that I didn't want, which is kind of annoying, but you know, that's just one of the limitations to this, to this, uh, Overall, I would say, you know, that's a very minor limitation, especially if you're doing like a ton of pin board items. Um, it can get really annoying to just do so many of them. I do maybe want to modify the colors a bit, but this is like not the most important thing that I should be doing. Like, I think I could find many more things to do in my life than adjust these colors more. But, you know, I'm a perfectionist, so I'm going to do that. They do look a bit long too, if I'm being, if I'm being honest, but uh, you can make them perfect in your video um, or in your uh, design, but that's just the look of it. So, okay, now the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna be adding um, some camera movement to this because you may have forgotten, but we do have highlighter. We do have this being highlighted. So this is an animation. Uh, step one, I'm gonna create a null object in Blender, it's called an empty. Doesn't matter which one you select, that one looks good to me. And I want it to be where my center point of my camera to, to be looking at. So everything's gonna be rotating around this null object. Next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a camera. And bro, like where is this camera looking? Like totally crazy. I'm gonna change this, send that like looking correct direction. Rotate this 90, 90, and then pull it back. Jump into our camera view. This is what the camera's seeing. So now I'm just gonna parent the camera to the empty. So I'm gonna hit um, select the camera and then holding control, select the empty and hit control P and set parent to object. And now when I rotate this, uh, this empty, it will rotate the camera as well. This is a much better way to rotate the camera and stuff than using the, um, actually rotating the camera itself. So I'm gonna bring this back to zero. And our initial point that we're gonna be looking at is up here. So I'm just gonna position this camera in a way that like sort of looks like it's it's on that, like it's highlighting that bit, the, the upper right corner. Uh, once I have all that, I'm just gonna hit I on the keyboard to set a keyframe, come down to like, I don't know, 120 seconds or 120 frames. And I'm going to 
rotate this and then hit I on the keyboard to set a keyframe. Now to make this look even better, I'm going to need, I'm going to need some, uh, some depth of field. So I'm going to come into this empty and select my camera and then come under my camera settings and select depth of field. And I'm going to bring this down. We're really close. So I, this number is going to be pretty tiny. I could of course, um, pick whip this paper to make it the sort of, um, the object that sort of focus distance sticks to, but I do want that to change. So I'm going to hit I on the keyboard on that. And I'm also going to change the f-top to 1.4. I want a really shallow depth of field to get a sort of more cinematic look. I'll come down to 120 and then change the depth of field until this is in focus. And hit I on the keyboard to set a keyframe for that. Now my animation actually doesn't take place over that 120 seconds in terms of my highlighter. So I might want to, I might want to pull that up just a bit, but I think it actually looks fine. Maybe up to like 100. Um, now with everything selected, I'm going to open up this little sidebar where I get my summary. I'm going to select all of my keyframes. I'm going to right click and I'm going to set them to interpolation mode linear. That's going to be really important because otherwise this would have like a weird rotation, a uh, weird curve. So it'd be like easing. I don't know why it doesn't just come with like linear by default. It's like linear should be standard. And then if you want to adjust the timing, you can do that. Like, I don't know why they chose to do it this way, but they did. So um, that's life. So great. That all looks pretty good. And now we can export this. Let's see. First thing, I'm going to increase the render. Um, cycle to like 250. Since we're using denoising, I'm not going to go crazy. For film, I'm going to set it to transparent. It's not really a problem because, you know, we don't end up looking at the HDRI at all anyway, but if we did, that'd be important. And then under performance, I'm going to increase this to 512. My 512. And I guess I could just turn off reflective and refractive before selecting my location that I want this to export as. So I'm going to export it. I've got a specific folder. And I'll select that. I do have this set to overwrite and placeholders. If you're rendering with multiple machines, you're going to want to uncheck overwrite and then check placeholders. But I only have one machine and I actually need to overwrite over my mistakes. Okay, so the last thing we need to do is we need to come down to like, I don't know, like 120 where we our animation stops. And I'm going to set my end frame to 120. Great. Now we can just go to render, render animation and it will render our animation for us. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please be sure to subscribe, check out other videos on this channel. If you want to, you can share your projects with us over on uh, Instagram. We love to check them out. Always exciting to scroll through our mentions to see what you guys are creating with some of the tutorials we're producing. And uh, again, if you wanna download this project file, you can on our Patreon account, as well as on Gumroad, if you feel more comfortable with that. Um, Gumroad might be up a few days after Patreon. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching.